Today is the summer solstice, also known as midsummer. But in this episode of Fabulous Folklore, we're going to take a look at whether they are indeed the same thing and how they may not be quite as ancient as we sometimes think. Let's get started. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. Like I said in the introduction, this week we are looking at the summer solstice because today is the summer solstice and that just simply means it's the longest day of the year. And this is obviously in the Northern Hemisphere, so if you are in the Southern Hemisphere, I am sorry, you're having the winter solstice at the moment. Now, because it's the longest day of the year, it means that the UK is going to get 16 hours and 38 minutes of daylight. And if you're wondering why I've suddenly jumped straight into the episode, it's because we've got quite a lot to get through. So, in years gone by, crowds have gathered at Stonehenge to watch the sunrise, and it always annoyed me every year when you saw the amount of litter that was left behind. So I do have to wonder how many people were there for the actual celebration, and how many people just liked a party. Now, the stones at Stonehenge actually frame the sunrise on the summer solstice, which does lead many to assume that celebrating this event actually led to its construction. Now, this year it is closed because of coronavirus, so English Heritage is actually live streaming its sunrise solstice celebration, and that is at 4.52 British summer time, and that's on Facebook, and there is a link to that in the show notes below, if obviously you listen to this before tomorrow. Now, while the solstice does always fall between June 20th and 22nd, Midsummer always lands on June the 24th, and for some the names are interchangeable, and the period is also known as Litha by modern pagans, and Midsummer is also known as the Feast of St John the Baptist. I should point out that the Roman festival of Fors Fortuna also fell on 24th of June, and you can learn a little bit more about that in the Fortuna episode that we did earlier this year. Now, Litha actually takes its name allegedly from the Anglo-Saxon term for midsummer, although it is quite difficult to know what has a basis in historical practice and what is a modern interpretation. And herein lies the issue when looking at the summer solstice and all of its associated rituals and magic. And we're going to try and untangle some of them in this week's episode. A large portion of the writings about Midsummer do rely on the sunrise part of the summer solstice and this relates to 18th century work that Stonehenge was aligned to this sunrise and that is what everybody largely agrees on. Now Ronald Hutton explains that the attribution of Stonehenge to the Druids actually happened in the 19th century and scholars assumed that if Stonehenge was aligned to the sunrise on the solstice then it meant that these cardinal points of the sun which also includes the equinoxes must have been sacred to the Druids. There's a problem though. There's actually about 3,000 years in between the Stone Age and the Druids who are largely believed to have been in the Iron Age. But the link persists and the now discredited work of Margaret Murray also added to the mystique around celebrations of Midsummer. There are various theories about the usage of Stonehenge but they do remain exactly that. Theories. So is there any evidence of a celebration of Midsummer by ancient people? Now, Sandra Billington explores the idea that the ancient peoples of Northern Europe did not celebrate Midsummer, and for her, Jacob Grimm was actually closer to the mark when he described two points in the summer calendar when people in Germany lit bonfires, and in the north they lit them at Easter, and in the south it was at Midsummer. And Grimm actually came to believe that the Easter fires welcomed summer and were older in tradition, and he thought that the southern ones had actually been imported from elsewhere. Now, Billington doesn't find any evidence in Nordic or Saxon literature to support any celebration of Midsummer, and instead, this earlier day, often referred to as Summer's Day, was a celebration of the start of warmer weather, not the midpoint of the season. And this could also explain why people light bonfires on May Day, which would also welcome the start of warmer weather. And in Germany, records of summer solstice celebrations only actually start in the 7th century. Now, as Billington does point out, this offers a huge contrast with the sheer amount of records about celebrations at Yule. And everywhere that you look, you tend to find an absolute ton of stuff for the winter solstice and a lot less for the summer solstice. 
Now, she notes that England had plenty of fairs and rituals held around the same time, but they weren't actually of a celebration of the season, and instead they often accompanied the holding of legal proceedings, so they weren't actual festivals. And these actual midsummer celebrations only really developed in England after the Normans arrived, and obviously that will be 1066 for anyone who isn't sure. Now, the summer solstice is an interesting one because, as Billington also points out, it illustrates the sun's weakness rather than strength. And if you were part of a sun-worshipping set of people, it's really weird that you would then celebrate your god at a time when he's weaker rather than stronger. And there wasn't really any need to do it either. And scholars haven't found any evidence that the Celts or German tribes did actually worship their god at this particular time. And in fact, the lack of sun worship at this time of year within the old traditions meant that they did continue within Christianity. And this is where we do have to have a look at the word litha, because I did say earlier that it allegedly came from an Anglo-Saxon word for midsummer. And it's not quite right, because as Sandra Billington points out that for the Venerable Bede, both June and July in the Anglo-Saxon calendar were called Leda which actually meant pleasant or navigable. And this referred to how easy it was to sail during the summer thanks to better visibility from longer daylight hours and calmer waters. So yes, Lydda, or Litha as we now call it, absolutely refers to midsummer, but in a roundabout sort of way. And it focuses on the conditions present during the period rather than its actual name. And let's be honest, we did also look at this way back earlier in the year when we had a look at the apparent goddess Eostra, which supposedly gave her name to a period of time in the Anglo-Saxon calendar, and it wasn't, it was just a period of time. Anyway, moving on. So if the summer solstice isn't an ancient pre-Christian festival, why do we celebrate it at all, particularly within pagan traditions? Now, as E.O. James puts it, these celebrations give, and I quote, expression to fundamental themes in the annual sequence of winter and summer upon which the rhythm of life depends and to which they give expression, end quote. So even if they aren't related to a pagan past, they do still represent the cyclical nature of life and as such are worthy of celebration. Now Ronald Hutton notes the placement of the festivals in the wider wheel of the year and he says that they stress the cyclical nature of the cosmos which reflects a principal theme of modern paganism. But while I'm saying all of this, the rituals of Midsummer are not a modern invention either. So let's take a look at where the traditional bonfires and processions actually came from. Simpson and Rowd, in their excellent Dictionary of English Folklore, do raise the fact that the 14th century monk John Merck of Lills Hall, Shropshire, wrote quite a lot of descriptions of Midsummer festivities. And these do go on to influence how people thought about these celebrations in later times. But the problem is the descriptions weren't the first-hand accounts as people thought they were. He was actually quoting a writer from continental Europe. So we don't actually know how accurate any of our conceptions of earlier celebrations are, at least where Britain is concerned. So you do need to bear all this in mind with what we're going to get into next. Now, unlike Billington, Ronald Hutton states that Northern Europeans did celebrate the solstice and had done so since prehistoric times. And they'd lit bonfires and carried torches, although, as he says, this was apparently protect themselves, their crops and their livestock against the hazards of late summer. Now, by the late 14th century, people had begun to get quite rowdy during these festivities, so the officials hired watchmen to try and police the event. So in 1378, the aldermen in London hired members of this watch to act as bodyguards for their processions. So the watch was basically a group of watchmen who acted as a rudimentary police force. Now, the watch processed behind the aldermen and they were carrying these buckets on poles that were essentially full of stuff that was on fire, which I guess was supposed to be a safer way of carrying torches. And here they were reenacting the ancient carrying a fire through the community. Now, the interesting thing is, because they gave the police, as it were, a central role in the procession, they became part of the festivities rather than being sort of adversarial in the way that the police did. Now, I should point out that these processions do become quite outlandish as time passes because every Lord Mayor tries to outdo the one before them. And John Storr describes these festivities in London in the 1590s. So we are looking at 16th century for where these things come from, at least that have been documented by an eyewitness. And he describes street bonfires, processions and people decorating their doors with fennel, St John's wort and lanterns. And we even see whifflers, who you might remember from our Green Man episode a few weeks ago, drummers and morris dancers in his accounts. 
Now, these processions also spring up in other cities, and the more secular parades include effigies of dragons and giants, which I just think sounds awesome, and I don't know why we don't do that more often. Uh, Reformers did try to get rid of the bonfires during the 16th and 17th centuries because no one's allowed to have any fun, and 19th century folklorists did manage to find evidence of them in the West Country and the far north of England. I'm imagining in the north of England because we don't like to do what we're told. And these communal bonfires saw local communities making merry around them. Now, if you believe some of the accounts, it was quite common for young men to try and leap over these bonfires. And sometimes you see people talking about this as being a purification rite, although this is usually more likely related to the May Day bonfires that you get at Beltane. But Simpson and Rowe do point out that this was also people just showing off. So it's quite nice to see that people don't really change where things like that occur. And for Kate West, the summer solstice is both a time of celebration and reflection. So we have oodles of daylight, but this also marks the point in the year when the days will begin to get shorter. And in some branches of neo-paganism, this is why the summer solstice is so tied in with fire. We're celebrating the sun's high point before the slow descent towards winter. And this is where we come on to the summer solstice, kind of the way we conceptualise it now. And it is recorded as a fire festival. And Patty Wigington explains that in European cultures, they would often celebrate using what's called a sun wheel. And this is essentially a really large cartwheel that you set on fire and roll down a hill. And a Welsh belief believed that if you did this next to a river and you rolled the wheel down the hill, the crops would be good if the fire went out before the flaming wheel landed in the river. I have no idea how much grass you would set fire to on the way, but there we go. That's what people apparently did. Now, some people believe that the sun wheel relates to the ascent and descent of the sun, yet Billington instead makes links between the burning wheel and Christianity, and here the wheel actually represents St John the Baptist, for whom the day is named in other calendars, and he decreased in influence while Christ rose, so like Fortuna's Wheel of Fortune, the burning wheel here represents these rising and falling fortunes, and that would obviously echo the Roman festival of Falls Fortuna around about the same time. Yet bonfires at Midsummer also act as a way for a community to get together. They provide a much needed holiday between the revelry of May Day and the frantic activity of harvest time. And I do think we need to honour the purifying nature of fire, particularly when you consider the amount of insects that you'd often have around at this time of year. And some people do use the solstice as a kind of mid-year reset, which reviews the year so far, and then you can make adjustments and course correct for the remaining six months. So it's a good time to reevaluate any of those New Year's resolutions that you may have set way back in January. I don't even remember what mine were and quite frankly I think it was probably pointless making them anyway considering we've just lost the last three months of the year to Covid but never mind. Modern pagans and many other religions do still honour the sun at the solstice and marking its astronomical descent does become a way to honour this cyclical nature of life and if this can bring us closer to nature and natural rhythms so much the better. And being in mind that we've got two solstices in the year, we've obviously got the winter solstice, which we've kind of looked at with some of the Yule stuff way back in Christmas. And Kate West reminds us that this is the time of year that we get another battle between the Holly and Oak King. And the Holly and Oak King lasted battle at the winter solstice. And at that time, the Oak King won and he reigned during the return of the sun. And then during the summer solstice, they have another battle. And then the Holly King wins and reigns over the decline of the sun. And Kate West relates her own community's use of the day for staging mock battles. So two people are chosen to play the kings and then they reenact the battle. I'm assuming that you make sure that the correct king wins and then everyone has a jolly time watching and cheering them on. Now we can't talk about Midsummer and the Summer Solstice without mentioning A Midsummer Night's Dream. And Shakespeare's classic play explores the havoc wreaked when the fair folk start using their potions for mischief. Now, Joanna van der Herven suggested if you want to seek out the fae, wear St John's wort in your buttonhole. And this herb, which is apparently best collected at this time of year, should keep away troublesome fairies. And indeed, many will tell you that the summer solstice is a great time to work magic of all kinds. And that does include things like healing, love, prosperity, peace and abundance. All things which I think we could all certainly do at the moment. And I would point out, however, that 2020 solstice does fall around eclipse season and magic is not recommended during eclipses. But if you're feeling brave or you're listening to this after 2020, what magic can you make at midsummer? The main one that I keep coming across is love magic. 
and according to Wikipedia, the summer solstice is a really good time to gather herbs for healing and it's also a good time to do a spot of love divination. So all you need to do is gaze at your reflection in water and if you're lucky, you'll see the image of your future partner. And this is quite similar to the mirror gazing things that you can do at Halloween for the same purpose. Now, Simpson and Rowd explain that Midsummer Eve, which is June 23rd, was a powerful time for love divination. And they relate a condensed version of one ritual where a blindfolded young woman should pick a rose on Midsummer Day. If you're wondering why a rose, check out the episode on roses from last year. And she should do that at midday while the clock was striking 12. And then she needs to fold the rose up in a sheet of white paper and then put it away until Christmas Day. And if she performed it all correctly, the rose should still be fresh, which would be quite impressive after six months. And then if she puts that on her bosom, her intended would snatch it away. So that's something that you might want to have a go at. Another practice advises singletons to pick St John's wort on Midsummer's Eve. And if it was still fresh in the morning, they would get married. Apparently that would also keep the fairies away. So, you know, kill two birds with one stone there. And you could also head to a church near midnight on Midsummer Eve. So again, June 23rd. And at the stroke of 12, you would then run round the church, scattering rose leaves and rosemary. And you'd have to chant, rose leaves, rose leaves, rose leaves I strew. He that will love me, come after me now. Now, I'm not sure if your intended is supposed to take now, literally. And like, I'm not being funny, but I'd be a bit unnerved if someone suddenly started chasing after me in a graveyard at midnight. I mean, that's a bit goth even for me. But there we go. That's what the the recommendation is. And there are other practices that people used to do. People might indulge in a spot of well dressing where you put a board out that's then covered in soil and then you press flowers into it and you can make pictures and all sorts. It's really cool. And some people might go, why would you do well dressing for a fire festival? But Midsummer does also occur at the start of Cancer, which is a water sign. So what you can do, according to Wigington, is visit a holy well just before sunrise. And if you can, walk clockwise around it three times and then offer silver coins to help celebrate. If you've got a problem that you want to release, and I'm sure we all do, write it out on a slip of paper and then you can drop it into moving water on the summer solstice and it'll carry your problem away. Alternatively, you can also burn it as well and take advantage of Midsummer's fiery nature. But please do that safely. Patty Wigington also advises that you can use the ashes from your Midsummer fire. So when they're cold, obviously don't do it when they're hot, add them to a pouch for protection from harm. Or you can sow them into your garden to help ensure a bountiful harvest, which is helpful if you grow fruit in particular. And finally, if you're a card reader, and obviously that's tarot cards, oracle cards, playing cards, whatever, it doesn't matter, you can leave them out in the summer solstice sun and it should help cleanse them of any negative energies. Now, Jess Carlson has a spell on her blog for attracting success at this time of year and she also has a list of simple ways to honour the solstice and I will put a link to that in the show notes below in case you want something really simple as a way of honouring it. And nothing has to be big or elaborate, even just watching the sunrise and meditating on the year so far can be enough. Now, whether Midsummer is an ancient festival or not, people have been celebrating it in Britain anyway, since at least the late 14th century, if not earlier. And in our 24-7 always on culture, I do think it's quite important to connect to the cycles of nature because they do remind us that it's okay to slow down and enter periods of rest. And this is going to be the point of the year where you get into harvest and then into winter. So we should feel that it's okay to slow down, have a bit of rest and relaxation and stop with the hustle, essentially. And I think that, for me, is what Midsummer has come to represent, even if it's not as ancient as something like you. So what I want to know is, how are you going to be celebrating the summer solstice? Will you be watching the live stream on Facebook? Let me know. Uh, You can grab me on Instagram, Twitter, you know the drill. It's everything's in the show notes below. If you have any requests for future episodes, again, please do let me know. We are going to be having a look at sort of famous witches, such as Baba Yaga next week, which was a request. So I've managed to put that one in, in Witchcraft Month. As always, if you enjoyed this content and you would like more of it, please do consider supporting the show on Patreon because it does basically help me keep it going because it pays for things like web hosting and podcast hosting and all that kind of jazz. It does make it easier to continue doing it with help. And if you subscribe at $4 a month or more, you do also get the exclusive episode every month, which is generally a little bit more supernatural in nature. But again, I do take requests. 
So with all that being said, I hope you have a marvellous summer solstice. If you prefer to celebrate for midsummer, well, enjoy midsummer as well. And I will see you next week. So until then, have a marvellous time. Cheerio. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com. And that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio!